Mr. Chairman, Your Excellency, my lords, ladies, gentlemen, Miriam at table seven. We first met on J date, she's never forgotten. I am so honored to be here at this major international gathering. I like to think of myself as something of an international personality. I'm certainly international in that I am Anglo-Welsh. I come from an Anglo-Welsh heritage. I have Anglo-Welsh forebears. My grandparents were Anglo-Welsh. My parents were Anglo-Welsh. Indeed, my parents burnt down their own cottage. <laughs> and if you are wondering why I am here of all places on a Thursday evening, then already we have something in common. <laughs> Actually, I'm here because I was asked. I, I do want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that the executive team at Ort, if they do nothing else, that's the end of that sentence. <laughs> that's not entirely fair. They do plan ahead. And the invitation for me to come and say a few words in the course of this gala dinner was extended some months ago. I had gone away to Helmand province, to get away from it all. <laughs> Went there for a couple of months, in fact, in order to finish my novel, because I'm a very, very slow reader. <laughs> and there I was in the tent that I happened to be sharing with Catherine Jenkins and Jim Davidson. When the mobile phone began to pulse, I picked it up, blew off the sand, and after I got through all the business, would you accept a transfer charge call from Ort? I found I was talking to none other than Dan, your new chief executive, elect. He was then elect. He said, do you want to come and say a few words at our dinner? I said, I'd love to. What do you want to talk about? He said, what do you talk about? I said, I give a whole range of absolutely fascinating talks. He said, well, would you suggest one? I said, I do a very interesting talk on prison reform. You're quite right, he felt it might be a bit too near the knuckle for one or two of you. <laughs> and then he said to me, weren't you a member of parliament? I said, yes, I was a member of parliament, but I am no longer a member of parliament. I do want to make that absolutely clear, ladies and gentlemen. I am no longer a member. This is a respectable occasion. <laughs> I am not a member of parliament. I am not here as part of some sort of uh, rehabilitation scheme myself from Westminster. I, I'm here of my own free will. I am tagged. <laughs> but that is for domestic reasons. <laughs> as Miriam understands. Uh, and I wanted to know too that when I was a member of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, I was a respectable member of Parliament. I dug my own moat. And my darling wife, she paid for all her own DVDs. <laughs> I, I was a member of Parliament until the people spoke. The bastards. <laughs> in my case, they spoke in no uncertain terms. Some of you may have felt rejection in your lives. It is as nothing as to what I felt on the day when 182,713 people got up with the self-same object in mind. Get this fellow out! They say you shouldn't take it personally, but you, somehow you do take it personally. <laughs> I was a conservative member of parliament, but I was a loyal member of parliament. I mean, instinctively, I am a loyal person. I mean, for example, when John Major became the leader of my party, to show my loyalty, instinctively, overnight, I found I was beginning to go gray. <laughs> a few years later, when William Hague became the leader of my party, Again, to show my loyalty overnight, instinctively I found I was beginning to go bald. I was only grateful that Anne Widdicombe did not succeed in her ambitions. I must say that you may not remember me being a member of Parliament, but clearly one or two of you do remember me. Earlier on I met Françoise Winton, one of the best supporters of Ort that I know, Françoise, who is the, well, you probably know her husband, Mr. Winton. She is the child bride. Um, Françoise said to me, do you still wear those colorful jumpers? I used to wear colorful knitwear on television uh, years ago, but I gave it up when I became a member of parliament. I got to Westminster and I was slightly appalled to find that somebody there did remember, because the first time I rose to speak, sitting on the opposition front bench, was Mr. John Prescott. You know who I mean by John Prescott? 
former Deputy Prime Minister, amateur pugilist. <laughs> the man who treats an English language like the Rubik Cube. <laughs> Actually, he's a good man, uh, and I like him. And the last time I came across him, not long ago, in the House of Lords in the Tea Room, he was looking pretty green about the guild. He'd just come back from Brussels. He'd been away on European Union business, and he arrived. Turbulence apparently terrible on the flight. He was still looking green about the gills, and he said to me, Oh, God, thank God I'm back on terracotta. <laughs> anyway, I got to my feet to speak, and as I rose to speak, clearly Mr. Prescott remembered me. I had some folkloric recollection for me and my jumpers, because as I began to speak, he began to go, Woolly jumper. <laughs> On I struggled with my oration, on he went with his barracking. Woolly jumper, woolly jumper, woolly jumper. Well, eventually I had to pause and point out to Mr. Prescott that the joy of a woolly jumper is that you can take it off at will, whereas the blight of a woolly mind is that you're lumbered with it for life. <laughs> Don't worry, he gets the last laugh. Of course, because he became the Deputy Prime Minister and is now wrapped in ermine in the House of Lords, Whereas, I, I am here. <laughs> but can I say there is nowhere I would rather be than here tonight with the, the beautiful people of Ort. Because this is my kind of evening, one spent with the beautiful people. Eating with the beautiful people, drinking with the beautiful people, and who knows later on, sleeping <laughs> with a clear conscience. <laughs> I don't want you to think though, that when I became Member of Parliament, I was stuck it there. I did actually end up as a Lord Commissioner of the Treasury. We have David Young with us here tonight, Lord Young, who's now thankfully back in Downing Street where he belongs. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well done, David. I, I mean, I love it. David just keeps coming back. They can't do without him. There are only two people with a proper office at number 10. One is the Prime Minister. The other is the former President of Ort. The government isn't getting at least one thing right. I was a Lord Commissioner of the Treasury, and this is the person who signs the government checks in the Treasury. And the last check I signed was for £136 billion. Pounds. Big bucks in those days. <laughs> now I appreciate it would hardly get the Royal Bank of Scotland through a difficult morning. <laughs> but in my time it represented serious money, and they said to me with these huge multi-billion pound checks, you cannot sign them alone. They have to be co-signed by the head of the treasury, who I took to be the prime minister, because on the door of number 10, it says first lord of the treasury. And uh, they said, no, 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 the prime minister is the first lord of the treasury board. The second lord is the chancellor of the exchequer. Then we come down to attendant minnows like yourself, lord commissioner. Uh, but it is HM Treasury. The head of the treasury is her majesty. You will be signing these checks with the queen. And so it came to pass that I would go down the mall with the government checkbook to sign these checks with the queen. And the first time I did this, I wasn't sure what the etiquette was. You know, which of us should sign the cheque first? You know, well, I didn't want to patronise the Queen just because she's a woman. <laughs> Nor did I wish to pull rank simply because I was the elected one. <laughs> However, on that first occasion, since she was holding the pen and she seemed to think she should sign first, I let her. But on the last occasion, when we signed this huge cheque, for 136 billion pounds, social security payments first quarter. <laughs> when we had both signed this huge check, I said to the Queen, you know, Your Majesty, the way the government insists on the two of us signing these huge checks, I can't help wondering, Your Majesty, which of the two of us it is the government doesn't entirely trust. <laughs> she had no answer to that. She's a good woman, and I'm so glad that at this gala dinner, uh, this feast that has been laid before us, as though in the past few days we hadn't had anything to eat at all, uh, this wonderful, wonderful meal, uh, that in the course of it we have toasted the Queen as well as the President of Israel. I think it's a lovely thing to do. It's an important thing to do. And I go to a lot of formal dinners now where they no longer toast the Queen. I think it's a great shame because I think she is a heroine. I think she's wonderful. Uh, very few people could upstage Mr. Bean, but she can. 
And she's been doing the same thing for our country for 60 years and more. And it is remarkable. Year in, year out, she delivers. And, and you may think that it's all wonderful dinners like this with beautiful people like you, and it isn't. No, the Queen has suffered. Think about it. On 57 separate occasions, the Queen has had to attend the Royal Variety Performance. <laughs> and she never complains. I know this because a few years ago I was writing a book about the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, and I found myself invited to walk with her, talk with her, as she went about her official duties. Hold on, do it once more. <laughs> it, it's for the JC, and nowadays you have to stand quite still for their photographs. <laughs> Now, have you seen them online? It's very good online. Not all of us are crossing over, but you should. Isn't it good online? Anyway, never mind. There I am in the Royal Box at the Royal Variety Show with the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. And I have to tell you, sitting next to the Duke of Edinburgh at the Royal Variety Show for three hours is like being locked in the commentary box at the Eurovision Song Contest with Terry Wogan and Graham Norton on speed. You get three hours of non-stop cynical banter. Most of it was Greek to me, but I got the gist. And the finale of the Royal Variety Show that particular year was an excerpt from The Full Monty. I don't know if you saw the stage show, the film of The Full Monty. It's a show about 18 unemployed steelworkers who form a male striptease group like the Chippendales to make ends meet. Oh, that's right. Anyway. Um, and the show culminates with these 18 strapping lads coming onto the stage and doing a full striptease. Everything but everything comes off. Fortunately, as the last bit of cloth hits the stage floor, there's a blinding lighting effect facing the audience to spare their blushes. Nevertheless, this male striptease show is what the organizers of the Royal Variety Performance felt an appropriate entertainment to set before Her Majesty the Queen, who was 86 in April of this year, and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, who will be 92 next June, should he be spared. This is what they thought appropriate for this sweet elderly couple. I can tell you it would never have happened in Lord Delphon's time. Anyway, this is what they were offered. I'm in the royal box with the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. The Duke of Edinburgh is looking at the program. He sees the word finale. His spirits soar. <laughs> Beneath the word finale, he sees the title of the final item, the full Monty. So he turns to the Queen and says, oh, look, cabbage, the finale. It's the full Monty. The full Monty. We're actually going to enjoy the finale this year. It's the full Monty. It's bound to be a tribute to the Field Marshal and El Alamein. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that Her Majesty and His Royal Highness were quickly, sorely, and rudely disabused. As onto the stage strode these 18 strapping lads, wearing nothing but a couple of golden tassels and a gold lame codpiece apiece. They marched onto the stage, they marched down the stage, they did the most ghastly dancing to the most hideous music, culminating in the complete strip-off. Ping, ping, pong, everything, but everything came off. They were stuck, naked. Fortunately, on cue, there was indeed the blinding lighting effect so that you could not see a thing if you were seated in the stalls. <laughs> However, if you were seated immediately adjacent to the royal box, you could see it all. And I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the problem with naked dancing is that not everything stops when the music stops. <laughs> and I also have to tell you, and this is the moment when you will realize how wonderful Queen Elizabeth II is. I have to tell you that this great sovereign lady gazed at this hideous jingling, jangling sight without a hair out of place, without a moistening of the lip, without a furrowing of the brow, she just gazed grimly ahead of her. I sat in the corner of the royal box, ashen-faced, aghast and trembling. The Duke of Edinburgh leant towards me and said, you needn't worry, she's been to Papua New Guinea, she's seen it all before. <laughs> He's a good man, the Duke of Edinburgh. He's the man who said, if ever you see a man Opening the car door for his wife, it's either a new car or a new wife. <laughs> this has been a most extraordinary evening, and I'm glad that under the table, I've got a glass here, because we've had a toast already to uh, the President of Israel and to uh, the Queen. And I'd like to propose a toast now to all of you, because this is the most curious gathering, most wonderful occasion. But to be honest, I did not know a great deal about Ort before I was invited to come here. 
And I arrived here this evening, to this gathering of what seemed to me like a curious secret society, <laughs> meeting in rather palatial surroundings. I gathered here and I thought, well, is, is this a charity fundraiser? All these people seem to know one another. They seem to be friends. Most of them seem to have met either this morning or last night somewhere else. <laughs> all saying Happy New Year to each other. They've all obviously been together for days. Uh, several of them seem to be married to one another. One or two seem to be married to other people during the course of the... Anyway, it seemed a very cosy, intimate gathering. I thought these people are... And then I began to hear about the charity, and I thought this is an extraordinary, extraordinary charity. And I got the briefing material, of course, you know. I knew about you being founded in 1880. I knew about the work in 56 countries about the, throughout the world. I knew about the emphasis in learning. Of course, I knew what O-R-T you know, what it actually stands for, which I discovered during the evening, several of you don't. Um, <laughs> that's only because, in a sense, we use rehabilitation less and less. I think the word now should be renewal, from all I know of what you do. But the point is, I, I knew all of that. And then I met a lady earlier this evening who said to me, of course, when I was in Moldova, and there she was standing, decked out in gems and pearls and beautiful hair. And I thought, Moldova? And she was on the committee, and she'd been there. And I thought, this is the USP of this charity. These people don't just give money. They give time and energy, and they know where the money is going. And what is interesting, the only reason I'm really here, is that there's something unique about me. I've got something that no one else in this room has got. I was born, ladies and gentlemen, at the very same moment as Jonathan Sachs. Which is interesting. <laughs> On the 8th of March, 1948, at 3.22 in the afternoon, Jonathan and I were born. Isn't that extraordinary? Yes. And I know he's looking for a successor. Not necessarily as chief rabbi, but possibly as, you know, friend to Elaine. Anyway, uh, the point is, I've, everything he's got, I've got too. But if when you go home tonight, you read Jonathan's, please don't look at it now, but when you go home tonight in bed, if you read in the program Jonathan's letter, there's a wonderful second paragraph in it when he actually talks about one of the fundamental tenets of the Jewish faith, one of the things that one has got to do when going beyond charity. And it's very interesting for people like David and me, who are, as it were, and have been professional politicians. We're in the business of making a noise. And ought is entirely in the business of making a difference. And wasn't it moving in the video there, the children saying thank you, thank you. And what's intriguing is that all you people in this room, with your generosity, have made a difference to the lives of little people who somewhere in Eastern Europe are saying thank you in English. They know our language now the world language, and they could send you emails. They could come round to your home, and thanks to Ort, they'd be able to work your DVD player for you. <laughs> this is the most remarkable charity, not because of the work it does, which is amazing. Education is fundamental. It is the only way in the long term to change anything. The only way, the only way to change anything in the Middle East is actually by educating everybody in the Middle East to actually thinking about the world as it should be. Education is the only answer, and the only practical way to make a difference is to get out there and do it, to find the teachers, the equipment, the talent, and then go in there and change things. And Ort has been doing that for 132 years, and you people in this room are doing it now. So I'd like to salute you and say I came knowing very little, and I go away truly moved by people who come into their new year actually, not idly, but actually really ready to change people's lives in a practical and active way. So I salute you. I think you are brilliant. I think this organization is extraordinary. Here you've come, many of you I see in rented suits. <laughs> One or two I've noticed with rented partners. <laughs> and why not? I've got a little Latvian friend waiting for me in the King's Cross, never tell. <laughs> That's if things don't work out with Miriam, who knows? <laughs> 
But I think it is wonderful, and I'd just like to end, if I may, on a serious note, by reciting a short poem, because I was thinking this is a gathering of friends, and actually what they're doing is extending their friendship, and you've got those, those children are now your friends, and it's a wonderful thing to do. And so I, I'm going to recite a little poem. Four lines by Hilaire Belloc that, for me, sum up the special nature of tonight. And I hope I get this right. Diction at the end of an evening can be quite difficult. First job I had as a young actor. Live radio. I played a young detective in a radio drama. Live radio in those days. Went up to the microphone with my one line as the young detective. This was my one line. That was the chair Schmidt sat in when he was shot. Didn't come out quite right. I wasn't very good as an actor anyway. I played Hamlet once, you know. Oh dear. When I played Hamlet, they threw eggs at me. Went on as Hamlet, came off as omelet. <laughs> anyway, this is the poem. Four lines by Hilaire Belloc that for me sum up the special nature of tonight. From quiet homes and first beginning out to the undiscovered ends, there's nothing worth the wear of winning but laughter and the love of friends. Thank you for your laughter and congratulations on the friendship that I think is Ort's secret of success. Well done, ladies and gentlemen. Well done.